I would just like to apologize for last uh, time. I completely, something went wrong with the recording. I think while I was doing the demonstrations and stuff, and the lecture got uh, looped up. But the second lecture, the noon lecture, was pretty equi pretty much equivalent. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to use that. This is our last lecture uh, prior to exam one. Next Tuesday, we'll have midterm exam one right here. And you're going to want to squeeze into the first five rows. Uh, just the way most of you, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it looks like most of you are in the first five rows. By the way, this front row we usually keep open during the exam. So you guys that are sitting up here in the front, the zeroth row, um, move to one of the other five if you, when you get here. And we usually use this up here for uh, emergencies and stuff like that. Uh, let's go. Um, something I put up in web courses uh, yesterday and uh, or or Tuesday, and that is, uh, and a few of you asked me about it in messaging. Uh, Dr. B, what's this stuff down here for lecture seven? Uh, down here, uh, lecture seven. A All right, um, right here. This is used guys, and the grade over here to the right. Uh, I just put in some dummy numbers. This one says 5.04. The digital part, or excuse me, the, the hundredths part tells you tells me I have it set up to grade your your questions for participating and for correctness. And so this one tells me uh, 0.04. That tells me. That's not logical. Neither of those are logical. It tells me that you answered four questions and you got five of them correct. See, this is what happens when I put in dummy. I didn't even think about that. Anyways, it should be 4.04 .04 or the, 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 the point oh something number should be smaller than the, the, the whole number uh, part here. Anyways... Um, I'm just fooling around with this. Here's the one for the noon section. Um, so you never have to pay it. I don't even know if I'm going to be posting this in there. I just want to try it from the software. And the reason that I'm trying it is because we, you may not have realized it, but I'm not running the iClicker software on my MacBook here. I'm running it on the lectern uh, that Darian is you that, you know, that, you know, is set up here. Darian's actually operating it, and I can't run Windows computer uh, software on on this one uh, on my MacBook. So I just have to try stuff when I'm around a, um, a Windows computer, which I was uh, the other day. Anyway, so don't worry about that. I'll be posting probably after exam one. I'll post a summary of. This week's clicking, you know, how many you answered and how many you answered cor uh, correctly. All right. Anyways, so you'll see it up here. It'll look something like this, but uh, this is just fool me fooling around. So don't sweat that one. Now, this is a, another thing I want to bring up to you. This is the uh, window in which you create a discussion post. In other words, when you create the thread, this is what it looks like. Now, uh, this is a student's question about uh, the last problem um, about F1 and F2, and we're going to go over this in a few minutes, by the way, on uh, how to handle it. And what I would like you to do when you're, when you're creating these threads, I want you to use them. Uh, make sure, you, first of all, you type a very explicit and precise title. So don't just um, put the title of the thread, help me, or something like that. But homework four, brain burner, question number six, or whatever it is that you're asking about, make that the title, and then we'll be able to, you know, use it more efficiently. The other thing that I want everybody to try to remember when you start a thread, 
uh, do these two things. Um, allow threaded replies, which will make the thread much more valuable because you'll be seeing people replying to specific posts uh, and it'll make sense. Whereas if you don't click this, then it'll just look, you know, like the, it'll be a real hodgepodge. It's not very nice. And I cannot set it to default to threaded reply, so you have to remember to do it. The other thing that helps is to allow liking. All right, so try to remember that next time you start a thread. And by the way, I ain't, it, we're, this weekend, we're going, you're going to have a ginormous homework prop, set of problems, okay? Get you ready. It's going to be a little bit of review and then stuff from today's lecture. And plus, we're going to have another crack at homework four, I decided. So um, uh, I want you to use the discussion area as a mini uh, cyber uh, internet study group. Now, there's a study tool, and it can be very helpful. And some of you have already started to do that. Here's one more thing that will make that a little bit more efficient. Now, if you, if you look down at the bottom of this image, this student posted some stuff down here. See down here at the very bottom on the left? 10 and then the up arrow or the up caret and then 2 to represent 10 squared. Uh, there's an equation formula uh, tool. Uh, it's this little symbol up here. Uh, and it's WYSIWYG, and it's based on the very fancy computer uh, language called LaTeX. So uh, if, you, if you do any typesetting of papers and stuff, LaTeX is the best. It's the fanciest, but it's also pretty tough. Uh, but the WYSIWYG is, is pretty good. Uh, so, and some of you have been using it, and that's good. And I try to use it whenever I can. Although sometimes if I'm just doing, you know, something to the second power, you can use the... Um, you know, the exponent or the superscript button. And if you're doing something with a subscript, like over here, uh, where it says F and a subscript too, that's easy. There's a button for subscripts as well. So sometimes I just do that. But if it's any kind of fancy thing, I use this uh, formula maker up there. It works pretty good. Uh, so if you're doing a thread, uh, you can... You know, fool around with that. By the way, I looked up this symbol, and uh, it's called a pill crow. I never knew that until I decided to help you guys. Uh, so there it is. Anyways, from dictionary.com. All right. All right. So that's study uh, study stuff. Um, Maria, did you have a question? What was your question again? Okay, hold on with that. Hold on with that. Okay, question eight. Okay, because we'll, we're going to get to homework in just a minute. Okay. Uh, exam one preparations. Now, just to kind of lay out the basic specs, we're going to tackle everything since the beginning of the semester. So that means lecture one until lecture eight. That's today's lecture. Uh, and everything in the textbook from the introduction up to uh, chapter four, section one, which we'll talk about today. This is an illustration from Chapter 4, Section 1. Uh, also, all of the homework, all right? So sometimes I bring stuff out and kind of push you, like with a brain burner, to think a little bit more deeply about something that I started talking about in lecture or in the textbook, and then, you know, challenge you to work a little bit more deeply with it in homework. So uh, review all your homework as well. Now... Uh, does anybody have a question? Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Doctor, and I, this may be redundant, I can't remember if we did it in this lecture yesterday. Dr. Brickner, will there be a study guide for exam one? The okay, I did this with you guys already. Yeah, the answer for that is no. Your lecture notes 
are your um, study guide. So think of them that way and, uh, and act accordingly. All right. What do you need to bring so that you do not get caught napping? Well, first thing you have to bring is a raspberry colored UCF Scantron. Okay, and they're in these machines. You can go to the SGA office in the second floor of the student union, I guess, and get a free one. Um, and they've got the UCF Pegasus logo on there. Do not use the brown ones. If you bring that to class, uh, I'll have dairy and body slam you and then maybe give you a, a raspberry. We usually have, uh, students usually have one or two extra. Anyways, bring your own uh, raspberry flavored Scantron. Uh, iClicker 2, got to bring it because we're going to be doing calculations. And the benefit of doing calculations with iClicker is that I, it, the iClicker software generates a spreadsheet of all your answers, all right, which is nice. Because then I can load up the spreadsheet into Apple Numbers and just and then I sort your answers and I go through the answers and if I see somebody's close or maybe they rounded off in part, or they forgot a factor of two or they forgot to divide by two, I'll be able to see it and give partial credit. All right. So it's not just to use clickers, it's to benefit from clickers because on a Scantron, and you'll have simple calculations on Scantron, you know, like the weight force of a four kilogram suitcase or something easy like that, all right? And that'll be A, B, C, D, or E, right? But the trickier ones and the brain burner, and there will be at least one or two brain burners, uh, those will be on iClicker so that you can uh, get partial credit and they can be graded in a just manner. Now, it's got to be registered. So if you haven't registered, and I know a couple of you just got your clickers, uh, what you want to do is go to this uh, iClicker tab here on the left side of the screen. Here's the blow-up of it, and register there. You can't... iClicker.com website will allow you to register, but that doesn't synchronize to my, my uh, roster. I synchronize to web courses, so you got to use the web courses tool. Uh, otherwise, you're SOL, and most of you are on, so it's 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 uh, academic, anyways. All right, bring a number two pencil for the actual Scantron and a good eraser, and I recommend one of these jobs from second grade because sometimes your pencil's eraser is a little bit old, and it ends up smudging the paper and not erasing and sometimes even wearing a hole in the paper all right so you don't want that and i've seen people and apparently the scantron machine over in uh college of sciences building over here by the student union uh, apparently it will grade a test that's been bubbled in with ink uh but you gotta be unusually confident to do that well, you know because you know you can't erase them of course question okay so how many questions are on the Scantron and how many do you have on mm, good good question uh, how many questions are on the Scantron how many are, are going to be with clicker I, I don't know yet I haven't written the test I'll be writing it this weekend and getting it ready for you guys on Tuesday but um, it's going to be two or three clicker questions and maybe four, depending on how, you know, what I feel like doing. And those will be two or even three points each. So, for instance, if I have three clicker questions and they're both two points each, that's six points out of 50. Right? Now, that means the rest of the test is going to be 44 dots on the Scantron. Okay. And did I mention about the matching for formulas? Okay. So the first, yeah, so the first four or five questions, maybe six questions, I'll have six formulas or equations or something. And then, you know, a list of concepts and you connect, you know, the match of the concept to the equation or formula. And that'll usually be, and that way you'll have formulas as if it's a formula sheet, 
but you get points for recognizing them. So you don't have to worry about memorizing them. You just have to recognize them. Question? You can use anything you want that you decide is righteous for review. Everybody's going to review differently. But these are the things, uh, number one, A, B, and C, tell you the things that I'm going to be keeping in mind as I write the exam. And don't forget, lectures include clicker questions. So, um, And the, the homework and the clicker questions are always significant. I... I, do, I try not to put stuff in lecture that's not significant or not important enough to cover, and that goes with clicker questions as well. Okay, So if there's a question in lecture about something, it's important enough that it might show up on the exam. Not verbatim, maybe, but you know, a slightly different form. Uh, so it behooves everyone to review them. So. Another uh, question, Anastasia. Yeah, so I might have number one drop distance formula, and then uh, one half gt squared is uh, option C, or something like that. Let me check my phone here. Okay, let me turn this off. Uh, so it's going to be either that or, or you know just the, op the reversal of that. Another thing that you're going going to need is a calculator. Now, if you have a tiny, nice one uh, like this that is solar and uh, just has a square root key and then plus, subtract, divide, multiply, you should be good if you know how to use it. Uh, but if you have one of these scientific jobs, you're, you're going to be fine if you know how to use it. All right? But what you may not use is your cell phone for any reason. Okay, you're going to have to have your cell phone out. And if we see your cell phone out, I'm going to uh, flunk you on the test and report you to UCF. All right, so we don't want... So just put your cell phone in your pocket. Get a calculator, all right? So you're not going to be able to use a cell phone for any reason, including the calculator on there. All right. And and most of the time, most of the calculations you're going to have to make, if you have to do it out longhand, like in uh, fourth grade long division, uh, you, sh you should be all right anyways. So, all right. Questions? Uh, yes. I don't know, Maria. Are we having a... Apparently, the answer is there will be an SI review. Uh, keep an eye on discussions. Maria will post the uh, discussions. It's not until the, the exam is not until Tuesday, so probably it'll be Monday evening or something. And so, and that'll be Maria's thing. It'll be an out, what, an hour or two hours? Okay, so so the idea is that if she can find the room, it'll be two hours um, in addition to the regular SI. Okay, so keep an eye on uh, discussions, and Maria will post something there. Okay, All right, and just so you know, I don't I don't have anything to do with SI. That's Sark. They kind of operate independently of my teaching. I mean, Maria's here. We try to coordinate a little bit on stuff. Uh, but I don't actually organize her work. That's uh, Sark. Okay, another question. Anastasia. Yeah, I'm going to. The question was, are you going to open homework for again? And the answer is yes. Maria. Yes, the exam is in normal class time. So just come to class. 10.30, Tuesday morning. And sit... Maria, where you're sitting right now, and everything will be copacetic. Question? Is there anything relevant for the No, it'll be, um, 
I'll reopen homework four and give you maybe one or two more attempts. But if you already maxed out on it, you don't have to take it again. You know, so and homework is always set up to remember and record in the grade book your highest grade. All right. So if you go in and try it again and you biff it for some reason uh, and you get a little bit lower, it still remembers your highest one. So. All right. Um, I want to double check some of the logic on homework five, item 19, and then we'll maybe take one more question about homework. This was the one where you have to figure out the magnitude or the, the size of the net force. You already figured out the direction in the previous question. All right, now here's an example. 10 newtons vertically and uh, negative 6.9 newtons horizontally, i.e. leftward. And so in this one, uh, there was some discussion of it in uh, the discussion area. Uh, go ahead and sketch this. Here's the, the layout for this particular instance of it. You might have had this one in one of your attempts. And there were several different versions of this problem to tackle. There were some positive F2s. You know, some of the F2s were set to, you know, positive 8.3 or something like that. You know, and so it's always, there's always going to be, uh, whenever you take a calculation question, it, the next attempt generates randomly a, a, a new random number uh, for the, at least one for the formula. And on this one, the random number is the horizontal force. All the problems you had were 10 newtons vertically, but the horizontal force was the, was the kicker on this one. Now, what we're going to do, make sure you have that sketch. We're going to ask some questions about this and specifically about the discussion to help the people that posted into that discussion thread, which you may have looked at, and, and that's what we're following up on, just the logic of how to handle this. All right, it's not a super difficult question, uh, but get your clickers out, turn them on. Uh, if you haven't used your clicker for the first time yet, hold the power button down until the rectangle in the upper left flashes, and then type in BB, Bravo, Bravo. That's our frequency code. All right, and then you'll get the Go Nitro message. Uh, Dare, are you ready for this? Uh, and on this one, I want you to use, I don't want you to use multiple. I want you to use um, short answer. All right. Okay. That way you'll be able to grade it differently. Okay. okay. All right, here's your question. Now, it may seem like a, a weird question, but it's actually significant. You're 200 meters from the Pegasus Circle in the Student Union, and you're not supposed to walk on that. You newbies, freshmen, don't do that. Did you already do it once? You, with the hat. You, this guy up in the second row, you went, oh, man. Yeah, don't do I, I caught a professor the other day doing it. And I gave him the business. And I said, you're not supposed to do that. I heard that if you do it, you're going to sacrifice the <laughs> Well, that can't possibly be true because they would be constantly getting crossed. So that's, that's, a, that's a fake news. Ding. <laughs> Anyways, so you're 200 meters from the circle, the Pegasus circle. Uh, where exactly are you? So A, B, C, D, or E? Which one do you think is 200 meters from the Pegasus circle? See now, the thing is, we can grade any one of them. Grade all of them is correct. I want everybody to get the point blank answer. I want everybody to get the answer. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. Be decisive. 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Ooh, 
doggies. We got 92. One, zero. Ching. All right. Now, I'll go ahead and show the. Now, those are the answers that you selected. A, B, C, D, and E. And what that means is that there's a spread of opinions. And some of you think that, uh, go ahead back to the um, laptop. Some of you think HPA1 uh, over by Starbucks is 200 meters. Uh, some of you think that UCF Library third floor is 200 meters. Uh, some of you think over the hammock trees over by the mall. I would be too nervous to sleep or to take a nap, but I see guys over there taking naps all the time. Uh, buying coffee at Starbucks in the UCF bookstore. Tutoring. Who voted for this? 16 people voted for E. Good. I'm glad you feel, feel confident for that. Anyway, none of these and all of these are correct because knowing the distance from one point, the center of the circle in the student union, that doesn't tell you the x, y position coordinates. All right? So I want you to look at this map. And I did this very carefully this morning when I was drinking my coffee. This image is from uh, a website called gpsvisualizer.com. You might want to jot that down. Uh, it's one of my favorite websites. You can, you know, figure out the distance between any two points on the globe, any two airports, three airports, you know, like a chain link of uh, airports and stuff. It's, it's a really cool one. And this one, it, it has a capability of drawing distance rings around a, a given point. So the given point is right there at the center. Here's the blow up of it. All right. The center of the student union, that's this red circle here in the middle. And then the red circle around here, everything on that circle is 200 meters from the Pegasus circle in the student union. All right. So Theoretically, if all you know is the distance and not the direction, you could be anywhere on this circle, all right? And that is why, um, you know, if you watch, you know, like Law and & Order or CSI or something, they like to track people with their cell phones, but if they only get one uh, ping from one tower, they can't really tell where the person is. But if they have two or more towers they get pings from, then they can triangulate in there. And we don't have that in this problem. And why is that related to the net force calculation? The net force calculation in homework five, it the calculation of the size of the net force strips out all the um, directionality information. And we're about to see how that works. So the size of a force is independent of its direction. In other words, if you calculate the size of a force, you also have to figure out some way to know its direction. Now, you may know both, and you might have enough information for both, but they're independent. All right now, question number two. Vertically upward, 10 newtons, and horizontally leftward, minus 6.9. Now, make this one multiple. Okay. Negative 6.9 newtons. Constituent forces, those are the two uh, forces. How does the Pythagorean theorem stack up? So which one of these is a kosher uh, version of the Pyth Pythagorean theorem? Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. 
four, three, two, one, zero. Ooh, 103 people answered. Very good. Uh, the, the answer, and most of you got it, is, is this one. Now, I want, I'm going to coach you on a little bit of exam techniques here. You know, if you're in an exam, and this one is obviously fairly cinchy, but if you're in an exam and you're, you've got one that has really stumped you, look for stuff that can force elimination of at least one of the options if not more. Now let's look at the options that are wrong. Because um, on a multiple choice test, there's going to be false options. You should be able to spot that they're wrong. You know, and if you get stumped, if you don't know which one is right, but you can spot some that are wrong, you can then make an educated guess. Right? So the number one uh, option here, A, uh, what's wrong with it is the minus sign. Pythagorean theorem in space, in three dimensions, does not work that way. But you might want to make a side note, a footnote to history. In the theory of relativity, if you think four-dimensionally with time as the fourth dimension, time gets the minus sign. You know, so you have an x squared plus a y squared plus a z squared minus a time squared in relativity, and that's why relativity is so cool. All right, option D. Again, this one's no good ski because it has minus sign. Also, uh, A doesn't have minus 6.9. All right, so A is doubly wrong. Uh, similarly, B has got a plus sign here between the two squares, but this is technically not correct. Now, some of you chose B. And this one will get you the right number, but it's not, it's, it's like a typo where you accidentally get the numbers correct, right? So this one's not good because it's, it's deleted the directionality information. However, here's the di directionality information. That's how we express it, a minus 6.9 newtons, all right? Um, it disappears here because uh, negative times negative is always a positive anyways. So, but this is the true um, and, and most accurate uh, quest, uh, version of Pythagorean theorem. All right, now, if you have your sketch, uh, go ahead and sketch in the rectangle formed by F2 horizontally for the base and F1 vertically for the right side. Right now, I've traced it in. And then the net force is going to be the diagonal of that rectangle in this direction. Right? From the place where both vectors touch. You know, and so in this one, the yellow dot there, the yellow circle, that's the set that stands for the center of mass of my object, whatever it happens to be experiencing these two forces. So you put the tail of each arrow on the center of mass and then figure out your rectangle. Or if they're slanted, you figure out a parallelogram. And then the diagonal is the net force. So there's your net force vector. Okay, and I'm going to park mine down here. All right. And you can sketch yours down there if you like. And then you can say to yourself, all right, now, there's my net force vector. I've done it graphically. And so now you can describe the direction. Pretty easy. Northwest. All right. So that might be an option on... Actually, that, that was an option uh, on the previous question um, from the homework. And then figuring out the actual dimension of it, you have to use the Pythagorean theorem version C. Uh, and so... You square out the 6.9, that's equal to 47.61. And 10 squared, that's equal to 100. And that, so the sum of those two is 147.61. And then you square root that, and you get 12.1. It's actually, I think, 12.149 or something like that. Anybody verify me on that? 12 point? Is that what it is? 12.149. So uh, usually on something like this, I'll specify one decimal point uh, for your answer. Okay, so for this one it would be one 
12.1 newtons, okay? All right, so as I said before, the directionality, when you're down here inside this square root, you're always going to have a positive number in there, even though you start with a negative 6.9 up here for directionality inside the parentheses, because the parentheses get squared, you get a positive number anyways, right? Any questions about this? Yes? You get, you, if you had a, a negative 10 over here, it'd get squared out. I mean, so you, you, yeah, you'd still, you, no matter what these numbers are, squaring a negative gives you a positive, and then you add it to the other square. All right, so, so the directionality would be, if you had a southwest, you'd have a minus something here, but then it would, you know, it'd still work out to a positive number down here, and you'd have to go to your diagram to get the actual direction, you know. Yeah, you wouldn't, the negative signs, all right, I see what you're asking about. In two dimensions, you use, in this class, north, east, south, west. Northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest. If you're in a one-dimensional problem, you can use plus or minus for left and right, or plus and minus for right and left, or uh, vertical. And in this problem, um, F2 is a, is, was set up to always be horizontal, so a negative sign does denote left or, or westward. All right. So you could put it in here like this, but actually you don't have to. If you, if you, you could write this just as easily, 6.9 newtons comma west, all right? And then uh, a, a southward F1 would be 10 newtons comma south. And then you'd have negative signs over here, but then you'd still come out positives all the way over here. So what you actually do in that case, you don't use the negative Not really, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Maria, did you have another question? You didn't? Well, ask your question. Which one was it? Is that this one? No. Hey, question eight was what? Oh, the ice. All right, the ice. Yeah, and I gave you a bunch of options. Yeah, See, and of course, yeah. In fact, we were talking about it in office hours. If you're on the frictionless ice, and you have a single thing in your pocket, you know, like your glasses, okay and you throw your glasses in one direction, equal but opposite reaction, you're going to go the other direction. And if it's frictionless ice, you won't slow down until you hit the shore. It's a pond. Yeah, so... Yeah, so you, when you hit the, yeah, so theoretically, it's a, it's a pond, so there's a bank, you know, so there's grass and a snow bank and whatever, but frictionless ice, you know, where the water is, and you toss, you know, even, even if you toss a Skittle, if you, if you, you know, you wind up and, and all you got in your pocket is a Skittle, and you, and you throw it, you're not going to go very fast, but you will be moving towards the other shore. If so, if you throw it, if you throw the Skittle north, you're going to head south and it's, you're not going to be going very fast, but eventually you'll get off the ice, well, hopefully before you freeze your, you know what off. Okay. But if you, if you had a hammer, for instance, 
or like a tire, you know, so they let you down from the helicopter and you got a tire or a hammer and you throw, and even though you can't really throw the hammer very far or the tire, if you throw the tire to the north, it's got enough mass that um, the reaction force on you will be pretty good, all right? And you'll go off in the other direction. And because it's frictionless, you won't slow down until you hit the side of the pond. Well, it's, it's, that, that's the, well, I'm just assuming that, you know, you have, you're a normal person, you know, it, okay, I see, I didn't say, you, you, you're lowered from a helicopter and you have Skittles in your pocket, <laughs> or you're lowered from a helicopter and you have a hammer, if I had a hammer, you remember that song, you know, you throw it. You throw it to the north, you head to the south, to the warm shore. So, yeah, I guess, I, you know, maybe next time when I assign that problem, I'll say, and you have some Skittles and a hammer. All right. Question. Yeah, even that. If you go like this, you know, that'll, that'll, and that, that boy, you'll really go slow. Because you're, you're moving atoms and the, the mass of the air that you expel is measurable, but it's not much. But yeah, theoretically, yeah. So, all right. All right. Now, and it's good because that problem on the ice is what we, we actually going to talk about that. One more question. Number one, which was what? Suitcase, the weight force of the suitcase. Uh, weight force is mg. So four kilograms times 9.8, which I believe is 39.2 newtons. All right? Yeah, so that's a, a simple calculation using F equals ma, but in, in the case of a weight force, it's F equals mg, because that's the symbol we usually use for the acceleration due to gravity. All right? Now, I want to talk about some concepts from Chapter 4, Section 1, Impulse. And we kind of talked about it last time. And, and actually, we talked about uh, Newton's uh, first and second and third laws already. Um, in this problem, or in this section for uh, dash one, we have two skateboarders, Bob and Carl. We know their masses and their initial conditions, i.e. their initial position and their initial velocities. We know the size of their interaction force, so we know how strong, you know, how much they can bench press off of each other when they push off. And we've measured the interaction time, delta T. All right, and in this problem, uh, it's not here on this graphic, this screen grab here, but the interaction time is uh, 0 0.48 seconds. And if you read that already, which you were supposed to do, uh, you realize that. Now, in the force view, using F equals MA and using Newton's third law, equal but opposite reaction forces, you can figure out everything uh, you need. So in this particular one, which you can look at on page 45 and 46, uh, the interaction force is 500 newtons. So plus for a rightward force, minus 500 newtons for a leftward force. All right. And if you have that and a delta T of 0 0.48, you can figure out the final velocities. You know, so you know their masses. You know that they're at rest. Um, you know their interaction times. You can figure out that the final velocity for Bob is minus 3.0 meters per second, i.e. his speedometer reads 3.0 meters per second, and he's going to the left. Similarly, for Carl, you can figure this out, 6.0 meters per second on his speedometer, and he's going to the right. Now, if you read through that uh, spec sheet, um, 
for the skateboard interaction, the left side of it, the force view, everything is um, done in terms of F equals MA and Newton's third law. Right? But if you read the right side of that spec sheet, and I believe it takes up all of page 46, then you'll see that there's a different way to look at it, and that's the, the uh, concept of momentum and impulse. And that's what we're going to look at right now. Okay, so uh, momentum uh, and impulse are a different way, uh, but equivalent to using F equals MA. So here's our spec sheet. I, I, I wrote all this stuff down. This is the basic specs from uh, page 46. So I just put a big old check mark on this. And yeah, we can use F equals MA to work out everything on there and get the final velocity states uh, for, for Carl and for Bob. Everything's copacetic. But what I want to do this morning is uh, focus... Uh, on these two quantities over here, the interaction time 0 0.48, delta t equals 0 0.48. So they're pushing off for almost half a second. All right. And the size of their interaction force, 500 newtons. Now one of them's going to have a leftward force. Carl's going to push on Bob uh, to the left, minus 500 newtons. And Bob is going to push on Carl 500 newtons to the right, right. Now, I'm going to ask you another clicker question. So get your clicker question, your clicker out, if you please. And we're focusing on interaction force of 500 newtons and interaction time. And the interesting thing about this is those two numbers are, and you should add this to your notes, those two numbers, 500 newtons and 0 0.48 seconds, they're the same for both guys. You know, they both experience a 500 newton force. And they both have an interaction time of 0 0.48 seconds. Right? The only thing about the forces is that one of them is the opposite direction. But size-wise, they're the same. All right, now, IQ test question. Uh, I think this is number three for today. Uh, what's the product of interaction force 500 newtons times elapsed time 0 0.48 seconds? <laughs> 20 seconds to vote. Na 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 na. Skip to Malu, my darling. Did you ever sing that one? Yeah. It's from when you were a little kid. Lulu, skip to Malu. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Darian's getting ready. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ching. Uh, let's go ahead and display this. And we got some explaining to do here. There's a spread in the answers. Uh, the correct answer is actually C. A bunch of you opted for A. Uh, that is incorrect. Go ahead to the uh, laptop, please. Uh, the correct answer is here. And C, and this is all you got to do. You're, you're multiplying a Newton a bunch of newtons times a second, all right? So the product is 500 times 0 0.48, and then the unit is newton seconds, all right? Nothing too bodacious about that. Now, those are the two equal things for Bob and Carl. So if you multiply force times interaction time, they'll both have 240 newton seconds. The only thing is that one of the guys is going to have negative 240 newton seconds because he's going to the left. But they're all going to have the same size. Right now, a newton second, if you look up here at this equation, 
Here's a Newton, kilogram meter per second squared, right? And then over here, there's your second, right? And that second cancels one of these down here. And so you're left with kilogram meter per second, right? Now that's important for us because that is a mass times a speed or velocity, all right? Kilograms for mass. Meters per second for speed or velocity. All right. Next question. Here's Newton's law, second law. F equals ma is the same as F times m delta v over delta t. All right. So if that's true, then what would the term F delta t, which we just calculated in question three, now we're on question four. Uh, what will that be equal to? Twenty seconds. Darian is primed to click. She's ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Now, uh, most of you voted correctly. M delta V. Make a note of it. And in fact, this leads us to the impulse equation. F delta T. That's what we've been talking about. That's equal to m times delta v. And the impulse equation is another version of the second law. And if you will, it's the second law rearranged. But it is the second law. Right, so f delta t... So if you know your interaction force and your delta T, your interaction time, then whatever happens to Bob, his mass times his change of velocity is going to be equal but opposite to the mass of Carl times his delta V. All right? And so those two numbers for Carl and Bob, they won't be the same. And remember we saw that? You know, the, the person... Uh, who was skating? Uh, it was it, it was you and one other person. Uh, she's not here right now. It was a girl. It was a Nancy. Nancy, Nancy you're not here. Okay. Ooh, she's dog in class. Anyways, Nancy, you could see that she moved a little bit faster because her mass was smaller. Her delta V was bigger because her M was smaller, okay? But they always multiply out left and right to the same uh, degree. All right, so here's what we know. Skateboarders are in contact for a set amount of time, delta T. Interaction forces are the same size, just opposite directions. So the product of F delta T has to be equal for each of them as well, except for opposite directions. Now here's the vector form of that. This is the impulse on Bob. The force of Carl on Bob, that's a capital F with a little arrow over the top, times interaction time delta T, is equal to the opposite of, okay, the minus of, uh, the force of Bob on Carl. Right, so, uh, and that's F with a little arrow over it. Okay, now, so this is a vector statement. And here's delta T, right? Now, the size of F B on C is 500. The size of F C on B is 500. They're both 500s, but one of them's left and one of them's right. See, the only difference between them is a minus sign. And that's reflected in this part of the formula, right? Now, from that, 
Knowing that that is equal to m delta v, we can now talk about something called momentum, or as Sir Isaac Newton said, the quantity of motion, which I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of chapter 4, section 1. If you define the momentum, and customarily we use the symbol P for momentum, I'm not sure why that is, but anyways, that's what we use in physics. Momentum is mv, p equals mv. If you think about it in terms of vector quantities, boldface p equals m times boldface v. All right. Now, here's the scalar version. In other words, no vectors or no vectoriality, no directionality uh, in here. Here's the vector version, boldface v2 minus v1. All right. So Bob has got a mass, and he's got a delta V. Carl's got a mass, different from Bob, and he's got a different delta V. Right? Theoretically, they're the same. Now, in this equation, the mass is a scalar. That's what we call it. Uh, in other words, it doesn't, it doesn't have a direction. It's just a count of how many kilograms or grams of mass uh, the object that you're studying actually has. So, do, so mass doesn't have a direction, as I mentioned before. Okay. So one way to restate this is to say that the momentum exchange between Bob and Carl uh, are equal but opposite. All right? And Newton's third law says equal but opposite reaction. But this is actually the best way to phrase it. Delta P for Bob is equal to the minus of delta P for Carl. Right? So that means, so when you see this minus sign, in English you would say opposite of, but same size as delta P of Carl. All right? And that's because F delta T is the same for both. The only thing that's different between them is the direction of the two interaction forces. So for the two momenta, the only thing that's different is the direction of the delta P. Now let me pause for questions. Yes. Wait a minute. What's your name again? Christine. Okay. Could I go back what? No, I can't. But YouTube, you can. You, on YouTube, you can at about 2 o'clock. Right. But I'm going to go forward to this one. Here's a postage stamp in honor of Sir Isaac Newton from Germany. In Germany, they really love Sir Isaac Newton. And it's kind of probably because of his hair, I guess. Anyways, if you look up here... Um, there it is, Newton's second law. So that's the, that's the way that Sir Isaac Newton would have written it. Delta of the quantity mv equals f delta t. And you know what else he's got there in the background behind him is uh, a prism. He's the guy that figured out why prisms do what they do. And they break up sunlight into colors. It's kind of cool. Yeah, so, so Sir Isaac Newton, that's his, um, that's his famous equation. And this is the equation for which uh, the women in hidden figures, this is the one that they have to operate, delta mv. And for a rocket system, the m's are changing too, so you really have a complex calculation. Uh, and I'm, I still haven't seen that movie. I am such a slacker. When it comes to slacking, isn't that bad? I slack at slacking. Gosh, it's like being failing at failing. You fail at failing. It's bad. Anyways, here's a good concept to share with you. Uh, impulse, the, the impulse concept, gives you an easy way of calculating stopping time. 
You know, you can use F equals MA and one half AT squared and VIX T and uh, one half AT squared. You've got to have a minus sign for the acceleration and all that stuff. But actually, uh, you, uh, you perfectly will, um, you know, perfectly uh, capable of doing that. But uh, for a question like this, uh, like as if it were on your homework, Hint, hint. If you have a mass of a certain size, a certain kilogramage, certain mass, and a certain amount of speed, and if it has a little bit of friction, you know how much the friction force is, you can figure out how long it'll take to stop. Right? You can use F equals MA if you want, but impulse is way easier. All right? So... The wording of this problem, and you'll see a version of this in your homework. Uh, and homework six is going to activate tonight or maybe early tomorrow. Okay, because it's not ready yet. It's pretty big. All right. So, but let's let's work on this one. Given a coin of mass 0 0.05 kilograms, sliding across a tabletop from left to right. So you can draw, you can actually draw a sketch of it. At initial point x1, its speed is 1.7 meters per second, comma, rightward. Okay, so you can give it a, an arrow. And then it experiences a frictional force, F equals 0 0.020 newtons leftward. Okay, that's enough. We can give it a, an arrow to the left. All right, so we can get arrows here, and we can use minus signs. This is a one-dimensional problem, so our minus signs will be sufficient for encoding the direction but we can make sketches of it as well and use arrows, of course. Now, the question is, the task that you're to do, uh, if you have a question like this, um, what is the stopping time? It slows down or stop, Danielle, at position X2, you know, somewhere you know, to the left, or somewhere to the right, and at that point, it comes to a stop. How long does that take? What's the stopping time? So what we're going to do is set up, and we're going to work this out together. Okay, we're going to set up the initial momentum, P1, and then the final momentum, P2. And those will allow us to figure out delta P. All right? We know what the interaction force is. It's the interaction between the table and the coin. The interaction force is the friction, little f. And we know, and we want to figure out the interaction time. That's the stopping time, All right? So uh, the force in the impulse equation is 0 0.020 newtons leftward. And we'll express it this way, negative 0 0.020 newtons with a good old minus sign to denote the directions, All right? So let's get down to business. We're going to first calculate out and set up P1 and P2. Here we go. All right, here's P1, the mass, 0 0.05 kilograms for this coin. It's not very big. And then the initial V1, 1.7 meters per second. And notice that I have it's I have an arrow over the symbol P1. So this is a vector statement. So I have to have the direction encoded somehow, and I'll use this, the word uh, rightward. All right. Now, if you calculate these two numbers out, you get a result 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. Now, there's no fancy name for that. Kilogram meter per second squared, we call a newton. All right, but we don't, and you know, a kilogram is a kilogram, but we don't have a, a name for this, it's just the units of momentum. All right, now P2 is the cinchy one because if you read carefully, it stopped at point X2. The coin has come over here to the right. It's come to a stop. So V is V2 is zero. 
so momentum is zero. All right? The questions about that before we continue? Yes? P2 is the momentum P at position X2. Right? It stopped there, so it's zero. All right, so let's put those together into delta P, P2 minus P1. Here we go. See it up here? Zero minus a 0 0.085. And yeah, that's zero uh, kilogram meters per second in up there for delta P. I have zero kilogram meters per second over there, but I didn't put it in there because I, I ran out of room. Anyways, negative 0 0.085 is the vector quantity delta P. All right, so there's my delta P. Now that's got to be equal to F delta T. Now we can put that, the whole other side of the impulse equation together. All right, so we got this. And so now we want to put that in over here on the right side, all right, where it says delta P in the impulse equation. So, so far we haven't used the impulse equation up until now, but now we're going to use it. We put a negative 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second over here. And then over here, we plug in what we know over here. All right. Now we don't know what delta T is. That's what I'm trying to figure out. But we do know the stopping force, negative 0 0.020 newtons. In other words, it's a leftward stopping force. And notice... There are minus signs, left and right, and you could cancel them right now if you want to. Right, there they are, one on each side. But I'm going to go to the next page, and I'm going to keep them for just a little bit, little bit longer. Right, so there's my impulse equation. We figured out P1, then we figured out P2. What's your name over here again? Bria? Weren't you over there last time? Oh, so you're trying to trick me. Okay, good. Yeah. Brianna. We got P, P2 and P1. Good. All right, that's on. That's right here. And we were, we were given the information about the force. That's right here. Now we just got to get delta T by itself. All right. So here's the impulse equation. Here's my plug-in. All right. And now to clear delta T... I divide both sides by negative 0 0.020 newtons. All right. And a newton is the same as a kilogram meter per second squared. So everything cancels here except for the second squared flip-flops up to the top here and cancels this second, but it still contains a second. So... Delta T here, it works out. You can verify that. Uh, matter of fact, anybody, does anybody verify me on that? You got it? Good? Okay. Anybody over here verify? Always check my numbers so that you can have a little bit of confidence when you're doing your homework. 4.25 seconds. Uh, so on the, on the uh, homework, you might, you know, I might say, give me the nearest stopping time to the nearest tenth of a second. All right, 4.3. All right, now I want to try an impulse calculation. We've got two more clicker questions. Let's see if we can tackle these before we dismiss. Okay, we just have a few more minutes. All right, you observe a large blob of green jello floating in space, etc., etc. Now, notice this is not asking a direction, just a quantity. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. Come on, you guys. 
Zip zap. Okay, zero. Uh oh, oh go to the display, please. We got some splaining to do. There's a big spread in the answers. All right. Ding. 12 times 2. 24, that's it. 12 Newton tractor beam. Two seconds. That's it. Now notice that up here, there's a little bit more information that might have tempted you, but the only information you really need to know for an impulse is 12 newtons and two seconds of application of the tractor beam. Next question. Here's a, now this one we're going to calculate a stopping time. All right. And I'll go over this one with you. So take a minute to do this one. Just like the stopping time problem we did a few minutes ago. See how you guys do. A basketball of mass 0 0.800 0 kilograms. Stopping force of 11 newtons. What's P1 equal to? P1, initial momentum, equals what? What point what? Seventeen point six? Is that right? Yeah, okay. Twenty-two is twenty-six. Yeah, okay. Seventeen point six. What's P two? Or what's P two? Okay, uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, you're not dismissed yet. We're, we got to go over this problem here. All right, one point six second. Here's your calculation. All right, momentum P one, seventeen point six. All right. And so that's your that's going to give you your delta p, um, and then 11 newtons on the other side will give you a delta t uh, of 1.6 seconds. So there's your answer. Now I have some stuff I want to talk about for just a second. Bear with me. Um, we're going to skip this section on uniform circular motion. We're a little bit out of time. So I want to skip over that, and we'll tackle that next Thursday. But you're going to have a ginormous homework, homework six, another shot at homework four. And I'll activate both of them by tomorrow morning latest, maybe tonight. 
So check tonight. Definitely by tomorrow morning. All right. You're dismissed. I'll see you for the exam on Tuesday. 11.50. All right. Now I'm going to modify.